be fun. And the fact that it's tied into the student needs makes it at least have a chance that it might actually catch their attention. And uh, of course, involving them in this process could be really fun too. So uh, just another, again, another approach to how to, to deal with curriculum. Are there any kind of the comments that have to be said? Yes, go ahead. Can we share just the core topics? Yeah. Like, I want to hear about everyone's core Okay. Topics. All right. Go ahead. Start. Okay. We did making friends and keeping friends. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay. No, you came up with friendship. I asked Yeah, she made it sound. <laughs> <laughs> How about over there? What did you do? Building self-confidence. Building self-confidence. <laughs> In the back, you, what was your groups? Friendship. Friendship. <laughs> yeah, we're the same thing. But we're friendship. like friendship. In general. Yeah. So, yeah. In this, it's such an important topic for children. <laughs> yeah. And it's something that engages them because it's high on their list of priorities. So, your needs. How about here? Trees. Trees. Okay, and then in the back, you did water. rocks. Oh. And? We had water. Water. Okay. Great. This is the nature side. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to share a, just a you know some kind of inspiration you had in doing this? In doing this in terms of yeah. this is something one of the people when we were talking trying to get that topic spread in many different ways and somebody brought up the idea about doing like a skit and as we were talking I realized oh my gosh a skit just the skit would hit so many it would hit personal development for anyone who was a little bit shy or needed to come out uh, plus you know many other things that we wrote down understanding people, the working together in cooperation, self-expression, communication, all the knowledge for our Earth, our universe, just that one thing. And that was going to be just a tiny thing in our, in what we came up with, but it hit everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to take, oh, Matthew. Well, oh, I don't know if it's helpful, but we, we couldn't really do it until we uh, decided the age of the... We did, too. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we had to do a, that, too. I should have made that clear in the beginning. You know, yeah. Seven, eight, and then we could really figure out how to do it. Yeah, so it's the flow from there. So in our group, we went for a hike first with huh? the kids, uh -huh. introduced them to the trees. Uh, we played meet the trees. Um, yeah, yeah, that was one of the uh, suggestions. That yeah. we had <coughs> and the leaves and all that. And then we went on to make the mistake. Okay. So the whole exercise all together also inculcates friendship and cooperation. So I think the whole thing okay. that so. okay, we're going to take, a, again, uh, 10 minutes, and then we're going to start with our uh, next uh, topic, which Helen and Rose and Redai are going to do on basically including parents in this all this process. Okay.
We do a lot of tapping, Eden Energy Medicine, at our school. Um, I even have started doing it before school events just to get everybody in sync and their energy flowing in the right direction. If you're not familiar with Donna Eden, she has organized a system of energy medicine and energy routines to help um, your energy go in the right direction and be as vital as possible. And it's, it's nothing new, it's just old information organized. So this is the first thump, we're doing four thumps. The second thump is right under the collarbone, there's a little bit of an indentation. You can rub it or you can thump it. Yes, if you can hear them. And if you don't want to do it, it means you really need it. That's what I tell the kids at school. They don't like that at all. But it's, yeah, it's absolutely true. And then this one is, there's a midline down um, your ribs, at the bottom ribs. If you rub there, a lot of us, it's really sore. It's a spleen point. You can tap it or you can rub it. Yeah, the bottom of, a uh, little farther than the broad, like the ribs. Uh, uh, well, often it's congested energy, and it just helps to move it. And then the fourth thump is right with the pads of your fingers right here on your cheekbones. Tell kids this is the worry point. So if it's a little sore, you might have a worry. Okay. And then the next one we're going to do is we're going to, this is called the blowout. This works great with kids, especially at the end of the school year. So take your fist in front of you. And what we're going to do is breathe in through our nose and then forcefully exhale. And do it again. One more time. Excellent. And then you take your right hand and as a, a magnet, we're, we're drawing it from the bottom of your, you know, your chakras or your energy field and right up your body, like zipping up your energy field. And I just bring it here and then I throw away the key. That's what we talk about. We, we zip up. We lock and we throw away the key and we do it three times. One more time. Nice. And then the next one we're going to do is called the hookup. So you'll put one finger in your belly button and one at your spiritual eye or the point between the eyebrows and lift up gently and close your eyes. Take three breaths in through your nose and then exhale through your mouth or your nose, whatever is comfortable. And this helps to, to strengthen and connect the major meridian that goes up and down in front and behind our body. Okay, and then shake out your hands. And then this one is not an energy medicine, it's a Helen Gorman. Um, so um, probably some of you know this. So cross your, yes. And if you have space, see if you can uh, go down into a squat. Are you holding your ears? Yes, you're holding your ears. Ear lobes, and then stand up. Nice, everyone's very balanced. Let's do two more. A little bit of exercise. Up, and then one more. Yes, it's like Cook's hookup. Nice, okay, everyone can sit down. What is that called? I don't know what it's called. Okay. Uh, <laughs> teach <laughs> the Gordon technique. I think it's part of edu uh, like education, physiology, brain gym, and things like that. Okay. Although I don't think I've seen it in a brain gym book, but I've seen other groups use it. So the three of us are going to talk about um, uh, how to. I don't have the question in front of me, but basically sharing education for life. Um, principles with parents. Would you like to read it? Yeah, sure, I'll read it. <clears throat> Workshop, how to share EFL perspectives with parents while appreciating the differences between the classroom and the home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Radaya. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, my background, I've been at the Portland School. This will be my 13th year. Um, I came to Portland right after Usha wrote Common Compassionate Children. She needed an assistant, and I came, and then she started to leave. <laughs> and do teacher training and um, it's been my joy. I've been the director there for a number of years and this year I moved into the classroom and co-direct with Michelle Mall. And when I thought about this topic, 
You know, some interesting things, um, we all serve different areas and uh, we're all unique people. And as you all know that have studied Education for Life, Education for Life expresses itself very uniquely in everyone. So I'm just gonna share my perspective today and thoughts that came up for me. Um, one of the things that I say to parents, I would call it a living wi wisdom school law, is that if the um, environment at home is similar to the environment at school, then you create magic. That you create the optimal um, expression of an EFL education when you have those synced up. And I think that's true of a lot of different holistic education models. I was involved with Montessori before Education for Life, and I know that is true for Montessori, and I imagine Waldorf. Um, but you have a high-minded um, intentions um, for this educational, for raising and education educating kids and when you have that that synergy the child can really get the benefits of that so that's something i tell parents when they call up on the phone and ask ask to see our school it's something i tell them on tours it's something that i say in my newsletters it's something that i tell parents repeatedly so that they they really get that because i see that that that's almost flawless um, when, I, when I was reflecting about being in the classroom this year, I had 11 students, uh, third to fifth grade, and I counted seven of them, seven of them, that's 60% of my students, actually had family environments that matched our school environment. They were respectful homes, kind, um, open-hearted, open-minded, they valued wholesome living, they valued um, raising consciousness. And I found myself feeling really blessed. No wonder why I had such a good school year. I think that that's a, every year is a little different. Every year our school environment, our classroom makeup, and there's no way to predict it. That's what I've learned over the years. I remember the most challenging class that, that I've experienced um, since I've been at the school was a kindergarten class. And I thought, oh goody, this class, all the parents are devotees. This is gonna be the most amazing class. And honestly, it was the most challenging class I've, I've, ever, I've ever witnessed. So there's really no, you know, really kind of, I haven't seen any pattern to really predict it. And so getting out of the way is probably, and not making any judgments or assumptions is, is um, it always helps. Um, so it didn't mean that I didn't have problems with these families, you know, or concerns or issues. We had meetings, we had conferences, things came up. But I really see that naturally when you're working with kids. I mean, you have a mother and a, a father often in a household. You talk about the kids all the time. <laughs> you know how to, to move through challenges and obstacles, how to support their best growth. And I think it's, it's natural for the, the teachers or the administrators and the families to constantly be in co communication. And so we communicate, you know, probably like most of, of you, you know, it does start, I would say it starts with the initial phone call, the Education for Life teaching, and it lasts beyond their outer school. What I'm noticing, uh, Matthew um, was recently from the Portland School also, we have a growing population of ex-students and ex-families that come to events, come to awards night, come to our joyathon, stop by, want to go on play dates. It's really, and and they all are drawing from us. We're still doing EFL teaching with these families. So it's going, it's, it's quite a, a long um, relationship. So there's that continuum. And then, you know, there's the back to school night. There's the parent teacher conferences. Um, I had to write these down. Newsletter, I always try to write something in, the, in our newsletter, just a couple paragraphs, taking a story or taking an idea to, to share an EFL principle in a new way for the families. Um, parent classes, uh, Michelle Mull, who's my co-director, did an amazing job supporting parents this year. She had every Friday morning, she realized that's when she got the most parents, she had a parent group that met. And it, it was education for life. It was a, con, a conscious discipline class. It was conscious parenting groups. It was um, common compassionate children book group. It was uh, service activities. They had a sushi fundraiser that they organized. It was incredibly magnetic. And it, it shared, she was able to share the energy of education for life and do teaching and, and with engaged parents. Field trips, that's another great way. I just came back from an overnight field trip for three days. And gosh, just to, to be with people, you know, night and day in all circumstances, you really just get to model and share what's, what our values are. Um, and then serving uh, in different fundraisers and, 
and um, activities blowing up the balls on the playground. Different. Anyway, the parent wants to help engaging them. But I realized that, you know, I, I, I think it is kind of black and white, although there's some movement. You have receptive parents and you have non-receptive parents. And all of these things I mentioned, they're great for the receptive parents. They're, um, they're <laughs> you know, they're, those are the parents that are easy to work with. Um, but I hate to say it's black and white, but then you have non-receptive parents where they're, they're, they're not involved at, um, pretty much at all. Now, sometimes you have receptive parents that eventually become non-receptive parents or non-receptive that go the other way. But um, it's... That's where I think the EFL principle of working with your parents as you do your students. You know, who are they? What are their strengths? Um, what is their level of consciousness? Where is there an opening? Where is their commonality? And meeting them where they are and taking them to their next step in their, their own growth. We had a, um, a parent this year that um, she hasn't been as, with us very long. She was, she's taught in Montessori schools and other schools and wanted to come into the classroom and teach. So she took a class with Nitai and um, she really got us in theory. But when she came into the classroom, it was painful. I don't know if you've ever been there when you have a part-time teacher come in and it's, it's painful because the way they're speaking to the kids is disrespectful and it's, it's shutting them down, and it's criticizing. And I didn't know how to work with the parent. Matthew was in the class, too. And it, I kept every interaction. I looked for an opening. I offered her materials. She, she, she always declined when I asked her to stay in the classroom or go on a field trip. I, I just, it was really stumped me on how to work with this parent. And then I noticed, um, we came back from Thanksgiving vacation, and she took a couple moments at the beginning of the class to ask each student, so what did you do? What did you eat? What was your favorite part? Went around to each student connecting with them. And it was the first class where all the students were engaged. And they, they listened to her. She didn't have to raise her voice. And it was the best class we had had that year. And so, I, oh, an opening. So I was able to say to her afterwards, she thought that was a really great class. I said, yes, did you notice? You connected each one of them. You had a heart connection. And when the kids feel that connection with you, then it's much easier to, to work with them and, and communicate what you want to share. Um, so that was just one example of non-receptive parent that had a little opening that I worked with her. And, if she, I, she's going to teach one class, not two next year, and it will be, that might be more manageable too, and hopefully take some more EFL classes to hopefully keep supporting her in her own growth because, growth because there was some openings. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about receptive and non-receptive parents is what I've noticed, now I teach a little bit older kids than some of you, but I'll end up working with the kids, especially if I have non-receptive. You always work with the children, but if there's, I'm definitely mindful if there's non-receptive parents that I have to up my game with this specific student. I don't have a partner. I'm a, I'm a, a single unit in trying to develop these, these qualities in them. And I thought of this um, a unit, a mini unit I did at the end of the school year, the last term, that I started noticing right after spring break, the way the kids were talking to each other. It wasn't kind. It wasn't from their heart. Um, it had a tone to it. There was sarcasm. There was rudeness. It was very disharmony. It just, um, it was very uncomfortable for me. I just, <laughs> some things I tolerate and some things I don't, that I don't. And so I worked with it as a class. We worked with it in activities and with our theme and outdoors. And we just built it different um, uh, activities to help foster that, that uh, speaking from your heart, um, the THINK acronym, you know, different things like that. But there are two girls in the classroom that I couldn't get to. Everybody else was beginning to sync up and be harmonious. But these two girls, and I just thought, gosh, how am I going to deal with, you know, how, what, what, what's next for these two? And so one of the girls, hers was intermittent. It came and it, you know, it, it went, and it came and it went. And one day specifically, it was... Um, it especially unkind and unnecessary and so that day I decided to call her mom and talk to her and um, mom was receptive she was glad that I called I knew I knew this this family well enough to knew, know that 
they wouldn't like their daughter talking this way. And I also knew that she had an older brother that spoke like this all the time, that was cruel and critical of her. And mom said, oh yes, they had a really big fight last weekend. And oh, I can hear her brother's words in what she said. And yes, I'll work on that and talk to it. And, and she did, and it, and it seemed to you know, really work out. We still had to work on things, but not, not in the same way. The other little girl, when I started to reflect on it, I realized her dad talks that way, her mom talks that way, and she lives with her grandmother, and her grandmother talks that way. And I just thought, she, there's, there's no way, that's all she hears, you know? And, and she goes back and forth to different households. So I started to talk, I started to work with her in a different way, and not bring in her parents at all, because there's no, there's no room for bringing it up at that time. But she was aware of herself back. And it was helpful. I think going into next year, I'll have the same two students in my class. It will continue to be an uh, issue. So I'm going to have to think of generate some curriculum to, to support that growth. But one of the things I thought that was really important with when you're working just with the kiddo alone is being sensitive with your words that there's nothing wrong with their family life you know not not making them you know at school this is what we do you may do that at your house i know your mom and dad talk to you like that but at school that's not the way we talk and this is why but not putting a, a kind of kind of judgment what i've learned from all my experience in the office and as a director and i'll close with this because I've made many mistakes. And, and, and we do because we're not, you know, I think we get stressed. We're not, you know, we're not being sensitive in that moment. But one of the things I've learned is what parents need most is you're doing a great job. You've got a great kid. Oh, this kid did this wonderful thing today. Oh, you, I, he's really great at that. You're doing a great job. And I noticed that that goes, that that they want, they all want to do their best, but they get caught up in life. They don't have time for things. They don't, they haven't learned the skills themselves. And they're, they're, it's immaturity who are having children, you know, somebody that's immature having children and they want something better for their child, but they just, they, they don't have the time or the motivation or the insight to work on it themselves. And we can all offer these tools, but if they're not receptive and they're not there yet, it's just a blessing that their kiddo is there. And um, just giving parents, you know, support, even though sometimes, and um, you know, you have to search for that area <laughs> of where they are being a great parent. And sometimes it takes a little stretch, but it, it really, um, when a parent's tired and stressed and feels like they're not doing a good job anyway, that really goes along. And I think in that we can transmit the vibrations that we're blessed with, with education for life of, um, you know, we're all in this together and, and we're here to support you. So thank you. I'm going to end with that and then pass to, <laughs> to <laughs> Helen. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm, oh, my, I need a talk again. Uh, yes, I do. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> well, everything that she said, <laughs> that Rose said, <laughs> and then I could sit down. <laughs> I would sit down, except that as I'm listening to Rose speak, I, I realize being in Silicon Valley, in Palo Alto, and having the children of people who tend very much to be technicians and scientists and engineers. These, <laughs> I, I don't want to stereotype, but sometimes there are things in stereotypes that are true. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the case here. So we have an exceptionally broad uh, number of, or types of people in our school because it goes from the scientific all the way over to the arts. And you've got these left and right brain parents it demands from us a tremendous amount of receptivity. And I remember Swami, in a joking way, once said, we should just get orphans. 
<laughs> it would simplify everything. Now, he was joking. But what he was speaking to then was the idea that we have these children and they're so malleable, malleable, and uh, they're going to come through our system and they're going to be receptive in varying degrees, of course, but their parents have never had education for life. Now, you can't stereotype parents either because some of them, as Rose said, are so naturally receptive and they um, actually have the ingredients of our system of education in their family dynamic. Kindness is a tremendous value in many of these families. And uh, imagination. And you just go right down the list of the, the perfect child. So they have those, but they don't have the, um, the intellectual understanding or the spiritual framework in which to place it. So that is the challenge. Unless you get the parents who just simply don't vibrate with who we are. And I personally, when I'm interviewing parents, and I spend an hour at the very beginning with each parent, and then they go through a whole uh, procession of required um, experiences with our teachers, the children in the classroom, and so forth. But when I interview parents in that hour, they think they're interviewing me. But I am really listening and looking and feeling and intuiting. Um, is this parent receptive? Will this parent really, really appreciate what education for life is? And oftentimes they are. I can say, yes, there's a possibility here. And then we get the child. And then we see the result of parenting skills, which may or may not be um, there. And the teachers actually interview the child. And they, when I say interview, they visit with the little one. And they talk and they play, but they get a feel for who that child is as a soul and as an individual. And also they get a feel for the parenting style. Because what oh, a hard experience, as Rose said, you get uh, parents who don't really have a clue about parenting and you have the product of that in their child. Um, then they come in and they're really at a heavy level of energy. And our school, I would have to say, is mainly on the egoactive and light level. It's really hard to make those two connections if the heaviness is what truly defines the child. So they need some other, they need some other um, stage on which to play out and move along in their development, but not in our school. And sometimes I have to explain that while we look like we have a lot of freedom in our school, we also have the structure which allows the freedom to exist. So that's, that's one part of it. It's that uh, first uh, exposure to the parents. And my job is getting easier and easier in terms of finding parents that will relate, will vibrate with who we are because so often those parents are referred by other parents. And that is the best possible scenario. That is the sign of a school that's been at it for quite a while. It doesn't happen in the first 10 years. We're in our 27th year. And um, when that happens, you know, number one, that they got the real scoop. That they, when they said the teachers are great, that other parent is going to believe them. When they say the curriculum is imaginative and vibrant and really involves the child, that other parent is going to believe them. So I don't have that first boulder of skepticism to overcome, you know, to convince, to persuade, but rather to reinforce because our parents, while they have the experience, our current parents, while they have the experience of what our school does for their child, they don't understand really how or why that happens. They do to an extent, but not really. And they're constantly trying to find out. So they'll come onto our campus, whether they're an old parent talking about how they experience our campus, or a new parent who simply walks into, a prospective parent who walks into the school, they'll come and they'll say, it just feels so happy here. 
And then we'll go through the classrooms and the children, really they're happy, they're engaged, they're loving, they're kind. And when they're not, they get guided to do something else differently. So that there is a whole culture at the school that is extremely magnetic and it's intimate. You know, it's an extension of the familial, which every mother and father would hope for their child, where they actually are seen as individuals. And we do do that. Our teachers are remarkable. They're the best selling point for any school. Um, now, the parents, the new, new parents who come in, have this sense of, well, how do you do it? Because so often, the scene at home is not the same. And nor can we ever make the mistake that school life, as Rose said, is the same as family life. The karma is different. <laughs> your karma with your parents is different than your karma with your teacher. And it goes on and on and on. So the expectations have to be a little different. At the same time, from my perspective, the more I can communicate with parents and articulate and help them articulate what is actually happening, the dynamic, the philosophy, the, um, the, the spiritual principle behind how the school unfolds for their child. The more I can do that, then the stronger our entire school. And I have developed some tricks. They don't even know that I'm teaching them. But every time I get a chance to be in front of the whole parent body, I feed them principles of education for life. And that happens at the beginning of the school year when we have the back to school night. And I always have one principle that I want to drum home. And it could be anything that you would be familiar with. But for example, at the end of the year, I introduce the end of the year ceremony during which we have uh, the, the giving of the qualities for each child and also the graduation ceremony. So this year I thought about it and I said, what do I really want all of our parents to know? And also it's video, so prospective parents will go on and see that video. And I only give myself about five or six minutes in which to say it because that's about what they'll remember. And I, so when we were introducing the qualities, I, I was speaking to the children, but I was really speaking to the parents. And I said to the children, I said, you know, when we founded this school many years ago before you were born, we had in mind a certain kind of, of learning that we wanted to see happen. And I said, and then as the years went by, all the faculty got together. And there, there are people that you don't even know, but you know Gary and you know me. And I said, and we came up with an ideal that I think you have epitomized this year. And that is that joyful children who love learning are the best learners. And joyful children who feel loved are the best learners. And I said, that's why we have these qualities that we're going to give you today, because they demonstrate exactly what that means. Now, I was speaking to the children. But those parents, all 250 of them, and uh, relatives and grandparents and friends were listening. And it was being videoed. And then when it came time for the graduation part of the ceremony, I spoke to the graduates. And I said, now there's another principle. I referred back to, to my earlier remarks. And I said, there's another principle that operates, especially in this class, that is specifically education for life. And that is that when you get right down to it, an education for life is about friendship. Friendship between students, friendships with teacher and student, friendship with the entire school. And I went on to say something like every single one of these graduates who are sitting behind me has epitomized that in one way or another. And honestly, their graduation speeches bore out that truth. One of them referred to Gary, our middle school teacher, as he's like my uncle. <laughs> you know, so the familial aspect of a highly functioning school is so important. And that's what we all offer. We love those children. We care about them. We have the spiritual principles behind us. Now, parents appreciate this, yes. 
Can they articulate it? No. They'll do it in a general kind of way. It's just a happy school. My child learns so much. She loves her teacher. They are so creative. They do fun things and they learn in, in the course of it. But they don't have the vocabulary. So how do we, uh, how do we work with that? Very slowly, very, very individually. Um, and I can think of several occasions when my vocabulary simply did not work on a one-to-one -one basis. Rather, I had to give an experience. I had to have that parent actually experience education for life. I had one situation in which we had uh, a family. Um, well, I have to be careful here. <laughs> But they didn't quite understand some of our music, and they had objections to our music. And so they were so upset because some children were going to be playing this particular piece in a concert, and it violated their sense of culture. And so I brought them up to my office, and I listened to them very carefully, and I made a suggestion. I said, well, I said, if the words are what bother you, we'll just have the children, because it was an ensemble, we'll just have them play it. I was compromising. No, no, we can't do that. Nothing really worked. And um, in the last analysis, I insisted that the children, because they had practiced, would all play an ensemble and that we would not sing the words. And that was capitulating to something that I really did not believe was the highest. But in that moment, it was the highest. And I kept it in my mind, and I said, we're going to come back around to this, but I have to wait. The play comes around. And what do you know? They show up to help on uh, set day. So I paired myself with the mom, who was particularly uh, vocal about this. And we had a wonderful time. We created, she was, they're very Christian, we created a huge bower of flowers to surround uh, the story of St. Bernadette and Our, Our Lady. And as we did this, you could just see that her heart was opening and that somehow or another, over the course of those few months, she had taken in just enough to let that sense of injustice or insensitivity go and to trust. And from that time onward, we had so much from that family. She went out and she, she um, uh, got more people to come to our school. I mean, so as, as I work with parents, it's the same thing that I have to do with children in my class. I have to take them where they are and go the next step and wait and then the next step and see how it evolves. Now, there are other parents who are so in tune with us, and they don't have the vocabulary, but they just say, I love your school. And they come, and they do all kinds of things with great enthusiasm, and one especially, a family who is just this ideal family. But they wanted to spearhead a teacher appreciation day. But the way that they did that was actually not appreciated by the teachers. <laughs> it was one of those things where it was difficult. The, di the, the, um, the what, what do you call it? Um, just setting out a whole lunch for all these teachers who all have snack and lunch duties, and you know, it just was. So I waited four years before I said anything because I was working with parents, and you have to get their trust. And this was not something that was crucial. Was it? We could live with this. But then I mentioned to her, I said, you know, um, would it not be easier for you and also uh, more amenable for everybody involved if we just took all this food out of the office? And I, I gave her a way to do it. And she, query, she ended up surveying the teachers. What do you like? And then we had this absolutely gorgeous spread every single day from a different culture out in a place that teachers could go to and so forth. But again, I had to wait, you know, like we wait for children uh, until you, you know, I see Gary do this all the time in the middle school where I am most familiar in the classroom because I teach there, but um, he will wait one year, two year, three years <laughs> before he actually articulates for a child what the next step is. 
until their energy has risen to it. And um, in a way, we are all, I think, emissaries of Master. We're emissaries of Swami in a discipleship that includes the evolution of every single parent who comes to our school. It's no accident that they're there. The heartbreak comes when somehow you get a student who shouldn't really be there. And the reasons are many, but um, I can think of incidents where a student, we couldn't serve that student. It's so important to try to head that off before the student ever gets there. But if they come and you can't serve the student, then what to do? And that is the most delicate part of this. And I'll tell you a couple of things that I've learned. One is sometimes that student has to go and it's heartbreaking for everybody. But if the parents fight back, and I've had this happen, I want my child to be at your school. This is the best school for my child. And in certain ways, they're correct. Um, then we come to the table and I say, well, what are you willing to do? I said, and I will lay the steps out. And I will say, if we can get the diagnostician to come in, if we can get this kind of support in place, if you're willing to do this, we will try our very best. And you know, sometimes it works. And that student stays with us for eight, nine, ten years. And sometimes it doesn't. And I, when it all comes down to it, I feel that um, working with parents is like channeling our teachings, our understanding of everybody's individual karma. And that's both the little one and the big ones. What is the karma? It is great karma to be at an Education for Life school. These children, the children in your classes, will walk through the world in a different way. They will be different parents. And then other children who might almost get there or almost get to stay, another incarnation, and they'll be right there in the front row. <laughs> and that's what, that's what makes, that idea makes it easier for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. in a place that they're not ready to be in. How do you kind of handle those conversations? Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I actually have parents fr of friends, uh, they are friends, whose children are not ready to come to our kindergarten because they need more social. And I'm honest with them. I'll say, you have another year at preschool and then we'll talk. So, I mean, yeah, sometimes, I mean, you always have to be honest. Yeah. It's just how brutal you're going to be. <laughs> 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 All right. How did I get that? I have a hole in my pocket. I hope it stays. No, I don't think it went back, did it? Oh, it's got a clip. Oh. Okay. Hi again, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Hridaya, and I'm the director here at Ananda Living Woods and School in the Village. And uh, when I was thinking about this topic, it, um, what came up first was how many hours a day do we have kids in our classroom? If preschool, kindergarten, four hours, um, elementary school, six hours, um, high school, seven hours. Okay, how many hours do the parents have the kids? And our school, you know, it's our whole world, you know, it feels like we give everything we can to our kids. And yet, they have a whole other huge world with their parents and their family situation. And it's really um, incumbent on us as teachers and directors to enter that world as much as we can and sh try and share what we do at our schools as much as we can. And also, along with that is that what Helen was saying, there's, there's karma, there's family karma, there's school karma, there's 
karma between parents and other parents, <laughs> between teachers and other parents, and that just exists. And um, it's our job to figure out how far can we go in helping a student? Um, what, is their, what are their next steps as students and what are the next steps as parents? And oftentimes, not oftentimes, sometimes, um, in my experience, we can't, and I, I think mainly it's, it's my way and it feels like it's a way of our school here that we wanna give to the students as much as possible. We want to accept people we want to accept students that we can help and we see the ways that we can help them, but actually it isn't always possible to do that. As Helen was saying, um, the family karma steps in and we have to acknowledge that. And I can't tell you how many times a heartbreaking situation has come up and we just have to say, it's sorry, you know, we just can't go further than this. I, I'm thinking of, and for some reason I seem to, attract intensity, intense experiences, maybe everybody does, but with families. <laughs> oh, at one time we had this lovely, lovely uh, boy, maybe he was in the ninth grade or eighth grade or something, and um, this was quite a while ago, but his mother actually was extremely stressed out and not, uh, not a happy person, but he was a happy, beautiful boy, but she was bordering on mental illness and so we were always, always watching, you know, what can we do? How can we keep helping? Can we keep the situation going? And Nita and I had a meeting with her and she got so upset in the meeting that she actually started kind of strangling Nita. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds shocking, but it's what happened. And it was like, okay, this is the end now. We love him. He's a beautiful boy, but we, we just can't keep serving that family. So. Um, the, f the families that we have in, um, in our school, they're very different than the, than the families in your school and, and possibly maybe closer to the families from Portland. But I always think of it, you know, this was a, back in the 60s, this was the back to the land place, the, the ridge as it's called. And so this is maybe third generation of, of back to the landers of some, you know, some families who we serve here. And you might think that our school is, is mostly um, families in the community, but it's not. It's, we have 75% families outside the community and um, just 25% in, in the community. It's changed drastically over the years. We used to just serve our own kids. So there's a lot of realities out there, just as there's a lot of realities in all the different schools. But our particular reality, um, you know, involves a lot of parents who are in that kind of that back to the land movement and they don't necessarily understand what education for life is, but they know they've had friends here. Oh, go to the Living Wisdom School. You know, it's a, the kids are happy. It's a great place for them to learn, but they don't necessarily know the concepts. And I think that's just kind of across the board with uh, all parents in, in some ways. And some parents get it and some parents don't, but they're happy when their kids are happy. They're happy that their kids are, are really learning good qualities. They're happy when their kids are learning how to behave. I had um, one time I used to, long ago, I used to go into Narani's class and um, read different stories. And she had this little guy, oh, he was probably in kindergarten or first grade by then, but extremely kinesthetic, always moving, jumping around. And um, it was a good thing he came to our school. He, he had good energy, but it was the how to behave part was, was kind of lacking. And I know that's what his parents were really looking for help with. Um, that's how we can really partner is when we're looking for the same things. That's when we, the teachers, the director, and the parents can partner. But this little guy, um, he picked the book. It was his turn to pick the book. And it was about, it was about learning to behave. It was about a little... Um, piggy family and the little piggy was going to school and one of the little piggies going to school um, didn't behave and he you know, was just constantly this is what how he was misbehaving and this was how the other kids related to him and were trying to get him in line with you know with their values and um, I read the story and and he, he was real quiet and then he just piped up and said that little piggy should come to our school and learn how to behave. So <laughs> he, he got what was going on. 
And so sometimes the best we can do is to, um, to, to get the parents to get what is going on and to partner with the teacher um, in that. And it, it is a partnership. And when we partner, when, when I partner or when the dir other directors partner and the teacher partners with the parent and the child, and we can have an open, open communication, that's when things really flow. And it doesn't matter if they don't get the concepts of education for life. Um, as long as there's that flow that can happen, the communication that can happen between the teacher, the director, and the parent. And oftentimes I feel like I, um, I, sh I sh should get more um, training and counseling because I feel position is a counselor to parents a lot of the time and it's not it's not just about the school it's about their life you know I'm sure you've had that as teachers too that's what you do you're you're reaching out you're helping with their situations whether it's a breakup I seem to get a lot of that um, there's um, you know there's pain about certain family situations you know it's a breakup they can't communicate you can't even have a have both parents in the same meeting. You have to have separate meetings. Um, and I found that I have to just keep, just make a friendship, just make a friend with that parent and give in what other, whatever way I can to help them to feel like I, I'm there for you. And um, I know I have this one dad. For some reason, there's been a number of split ups in the last few years in our school. And I have this one dad that was so standoffish from me and just would not come and meet me um, and was not really involved other than dropping off on my days. And, um, and that made me feel like, oh, he doesn't really like me. And then that's what I had to get over. He doesn't like me. And I have to find out who is this guy. You know, but we have a lot of dreadlocks. We have a lot of, you know. It's just a different way of dressing and a different way of looking, and sometimes that can put people off, but that obviously you have to get in there <laughs> and just be with that person. So finally, I got him to come in and, and talk with me. Um, and it was just, he just opened up to me. He started crying. He was telling me about the, you know, all the pain in his relationship. With, and from that time on, we were just close. And if I, you know, if I needed to talk to him about something, I still had to find him because he wouldn't answer an email. He, you know, his, his phone messages were always filled up. But as long as I found him and I could connect with him, um, you know, we have, we, st we have that connection. So that's so important. Um, just, a f I guess, a few words about education for life and trying, you know, we really do need to try to get parents to understand what we're doing. And we, you know, over the years, we've tried so many ways. You know, Nitai's given many classes, parent classes, that eh, not that many people show up for, necessarily. And so it's not, our parents aren't necessarily looking, th they don't relate in an intellectual way, necessarily, but they relate more in a feeling way. So over the years, it's been like, oh, now how should we try and connect with parents? How can we make them... We want a family feeling in our school, right? We want them to at least have some kind of understanding of what we're doing. Um, so one way we've done that is, you know, we have the back to school nights. I'm sure everybody does that. That are um, so they can visit all the classes. They're invited to go into all the classes, and there's activities in all the different classes. Something that you get to participate in, or a dance you get to participate in. Like Narani's class, she often leads. The kids do a little dance and the parents can get involved with it, or song, ac art activity, anything that involves parents. Oh, now go on to the next class, go to that class. And they're used to now visiting all the classes, and so that helps create that family feeling. Um, we have a Thanksgiving time, we have a Thanksgiving dinner that we invite um, all the parents to. Please bring all your family that's here visiting for Thanksgiving. Um, we used to have it up at the um, meditation retreat, which just bringing people up to the meditation retreat, you don't even know what's happening to you, but you're feeling you're involved in the vibrations and you're feeling those vibrations. And pe people just love to, are we going there again? Are we going there again? 
and then you know the kids cook and serve and then they 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 also do um, different little skits um, for the parents yeah and it's really lovely and it's a the parents really look forward to it I didn't really understand how much they looked forward to it for a while but it's something that they can feel people want to feel you're a family yeah Mm-hmm. And they're just walking out to this place where there's a beautiful, beautiful vista, and it just, they created that part of that event. Mm-hmm. And it yeah, we didn't even know about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we started another tradition um, at Christmas time. You know, just like everyone, you, you probably have many religions in your school. Oh, yeah, and you know, we have, you know, there's pagan here, there's, uh, there's Jewish, there's Christian, there's agnostic, there's atheist, but, but you wouldn't really want to be at this school unless you felt some kinship to some kind of light in your life, somehow, however that comes into you. And so, um, so we started um, at Christmas time a little program we call Celebrating the Light. And so usually there's a um, one year when Brian well, uh, told the story, he, he told a, a Jewish story. Um, we, we do, you know, we usually bring in some kind of a Christmas story, but that's not the overall focus. The overall focus is celebrating the light that comes in. And we all, I think people's most favorite part is we have a nature altar, and Narani has all these beautiful shells, and we bring in flowers, we bring in... Um, all kinds of things in nature that sometimes the kids go and collect and bows and we have um, we do sing Christmas carols and we sing the Christmas carols as people are going and and offering put their put their nature altars put their nature items on the altar and then at the end we um, we have a tradition of doing it's I guess it's it's not really a Sufi dance but it's a circle dance where we sing and we squish the circle in together we start big and we squish it in together a spiral, that's it. And um, you just can feel the energy of that, and people just love it, because you would get all in together, kind of just sharing in the energy, and then we own, and people don't want to leave. So creating those kinds of things, at least that works for, for our school family, um, helps with that sense of we're here together, we have connections, if we need help, we'll ask for it that type of thing. Um, But just to end, what I was telling you that we haven't been that successful in offering um, Education for Life classes to parents. But (laughs) this last year, and maybe I'll let Usha talk a little bit about it, we have now we have a a few parents who have, some of them have grown up at Ananda now, they're having their own kids, and they want, they wanted an EFL class. But what happened was, it was, it's an EFL class designed around how do you bring, it, how do you bring these um, ways of being with children and guiding children into your home so, and, and so there can be crossover between what happens at school and what happens at home. And um, that, what, those have been really successful classes. Um, maybe, I don't know if you want to say a couple words about it, Isha? <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe you have to have this. Oh, yes. I'll just sit next to you because okay. I have this. Thing That's good. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we had a lot of experience giving classes in Portland, so I've learned along the way. So one of the secrets is to give it a, a good title. Mm-hmm. So not tools of maturity. Uh, <laughs> progressive development. Not progressive <laughs> development, but um, how to motivate your child or moving them from I can't to I will, that's a popular title. Um, And I'm trying to remember what tools to maturity, but anyway, the important thing is um, a few points. This will help you do this and this and this. We can send you the promo if you want it. And then, like Helen said, the important thing is not just teaching them the philosophy, not just standing there and talking, but giving them some experiences. So, for example, um, when we talk about the, the 
people have um, demonstrated today some curiosity about what are we talking about when we say heavy and ego active and, and uh, light. So we talk about that and I talk about how to motivate each. And I hope you all know that heavy, the very the best thing you can do is action. Get the child moving. When anybody or an adult, when you're, you know, it's any kind of action, some movement. So, for example, in the class on that, you've been talking for 20 minutes and everybody looks like you do right now, except a couple of you. Maybe a couple of you are smiling and being alert, and, um, but most of you, we've, you've been listening a long time. And so I, pulled, I just said, stop, <coughs> shut your eyes, what's your energy like? We'd already done this a couple of times at the beginning of the class, so they knew what that meant. And then I pulled some balloons out of the conference room and said, okay, keep these balloons in the air. And they all jump up mm -hmm. and do that for a few minutes. And then I said, okay, stop and sit down. And then I go, still, go back inside. How's it different? And they'll, and they'll say, God, I'm alert. I feel this is, uh, this is great. You know, I'm feeling so much more energy. And I go, okay, so that's the principle of when your child is absolutely lying in bed, won't do anything, <coughs> the answer's not reasoning, the answer's not, you know, might end up being a consequence, but that's the last thing you want to do. The answer is get them to move in some way. And then I give lots of examples from the classroom. And afterwards, the parent actually, it's the first time this ever happened, one of these very alternative parents, I had assumptions, mm -hmm. which I shouldn't, and he came up to me after he said, that was such a great way to teach that. And I thought, oh my gosh. Not only did a lot of them get it, he even got <coughs> it, that I taught it through experience. So that was really fun. And um, it can be fun. It's got to be fun. If it's not fun, if you're not joyful, it's not EFL, right? Right, and you won't come back. <laughs> and you won't come back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, this is the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Schedule. So, this afternoon, the after break, we have a break until 2 o'clock. I need to find out what people are wondering from experience. So, <coughs> who would be interested in exchanging ideas about working with what we call the late body years, which is basically three and four year olds? Can I raise your hand? Okay, <laughs> now the whole, like, the whole option you go. Basically, three and four year olds would be one group. Five to seven year olds would be another group. Eight to uh, 11 would be another group. 12 to 15 might be another group. So you have to kind of choose one of those groups. Thanks. Okay, so the early, earliest group. We're only going for one. Or <laughs> yeah, you can only go to one. Yeah, yeah. Unless okay. we're two bodies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, can you take people to your classroom? Yes, I'll have to move a couple things, but yes. Okay, so if you're with that, we've been at 2 o'clock, we meet at Joy down at the Aspen building, which is the two story building just down the hill about five minutes. Little white fence. Okay. Um, how about the next group up from about, uh, let's see, where do we go? About five, five to seven year olds? Okay, so Narani, can you go? Can you go to your class? So, do you want to tell them how to get to your class? So you go down this road, and there'll be one driveway that you pass, and then there'll be another, the second driveway. You'll see a two-story building, park there, and then you're gonna follow the walkway around. There's a single-story building. My classroom is the front one with a big deck on the front. So, is it a big building? They're all. They're all blue, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I've walked yes, past one. <laughs> you start knocking on doors. Okay, how about eight, nine, ten year olds? Okay. So Aaron and Matthew, we can share that. Do you have, do you have your classroom semi set up? Yeah. So let's, why don't you tell them how to get to your classroom? Uh, first driveway, first parking lot on the right here, and it's the classroom on the right, Cherry. You go downstairs. Yeah, there's some little. Yeah. Okay. Um, 11, 12, 13. 
Yours, anybody for that? 12 to 15. Pardon? 12 to 15. Right? 12 to 15, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh, it's done. Right. 12 to 15. Okay, so, so the, you were marched in 12 to 15 rather than, <coughs> rather than 10 to 11 year olds? Yes. Is nobody for 10 to 11 year olds? Oh, okay. Didn't we already have 10 to 11? Yeah, we're 8 out of 10. Okay, all right, so older kids will meet here. Okay. And uh, maybe Balarama, can you come? You what? I'm taking care of, uh, I'm doing Willie's Oh, for Willie. Oh, okay. All right. So great, great Dharma to have. Okay, we'll meet, we'll meet here at 2 o'clock. Okay. The older kids. Here. Yeah, just come back, same place. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, is the movie, is that the meditation? Oh, thank you, thank you. How okay. do you reach the meditation? Okay, so then the, uh, we got the afternoon planned out, then the, eight, the at 5 o'clock we're meeting up at the meditation retreat. It says it's a sadhana, which is, if you'd like to have a time of yoga postures and meditation, that's in the, you can meet in the temple up there. If you'd rather just walk around, there's, there's a beautiful garden up there, you're free to just choose your own way of sp spending that time. Does anybody need, does anybody need a ride up? Nice carpool. Carpool, okay, so... Um, no, I, I can take one more person. I can drive. Okay, so we're to meet, we'll meet at the market, is that good? Okay. So we'll meet... Okay. Maybe front. Can we meet you at the market and maybe call you? Because we yeah, really know that's fine. So 4.30 at the market, we'll meet. Uh, but I already asked who's coming for dinner. The movie is also up at Meditation Retreat. So if you're interested in the movie, you have to go up to Meditation Retreat. Okay, that's it. Have a great lunch. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.